from the wrong side of the tracks to getting on track. Hello and welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. This is your home on the web for no hype, no BS, straight talk on how to make more money growing your own business, how to make money in sales. When I got out of the Air Force in 1997, I jumped into commissioned sales. I had a wife, a baby, another one on the way, and I had to succeed. What you get here is free advice and insight from myself and from the guests that I bring on to help you do just that. Sell more, faster, at higher margin with less stress and more fun. Along those lines, please avail yourself of this free resource at thebestsalessecrets.com. It's a 21-page guide that I created covering my 21 years in sales and marketing. And like I said, it is totally free. At the end of today's interview, I will give you another URL to help you grow your sales, but you have to wait until the end. But until then, enjoy this interview with Michael Massey, a former military guy like myself, hard-headed as well. That's probably why we get along, uh, where he talks about how to be a little guy and beat the big guy to become a big guy without appearing to be a big guy or gal. Enjoy. Mr. Mike Massey, all the way from my former hometown, Austin, Texas, where you're keeping it weird, I'm sure. Huh? Welcome to the Sales Podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Wes. <laughs> uh, so I, I ran across you online. We got some mutual friends, some folks we hang out with, uh, some political views we uh, are eye to eye with. We we may leave that out of the discussion today because, you know, like Michael Jordan said, Republicans and Democrats buy tennis shoes, right? Uh, <laughs> but most people that listen to me know what my thoughts and feelings are on that. However, uh, you are uh, a successful entrepreneur, uh, coach, uh, author, yada, yada. But for those that don't know you, would you mind, you know, take a minute or two, uh, give us a little thumbnail sketch of who you are and what you do, and, and we'll go down the rabbit hole? Sure. Yeah. When uh, <laughs> I was uh, the uh, type of kid who came uh, stereotypically from the wrong side of the tracks, <laughs> ended up ended up on my own when I was about 17 years old, got kicked out of my house, never finished high school, um, kicked around, uh, tried the military for a while, didn't work out for me. I was uh, too much of a knucklehead. But uh, I'd always had a dream of doing martial arts for a living. Now, I didn't really have any idea how I was going to do that, but I knew it was something I wanted to do, and I'd been talked out of it by my parents, family, girlfriends, etc., about a half dozen times, and then finally decided, you know what, it's time to either you know, uh, you know, do this or or give up on the dream. So I came to Austin, Texas, at the age of 22, with about 50 bucks in my pocket and an old broken down car, uh, in order to pursue my dream of teaching martial arts full time. And started off with a uh, one of my instructors, master instructors at a school he was starting. We had some philosophical differences, so uh, I, I left that school and started my own business. And about two years later, I was running a uh, very successful full-time studio in Georgetown, Texas. So after about eight years of running that studio and ten years of teaching professionally – uh, I got the uh, I got the law school bug. I decided that I wanted to go to law school, and uh, that was a mistake. Uh, that's a that's a story for for another show. But uh, in the interim, when uh, from the time that I sold that studio to the time I got in law school, I decided I needed to do something with my time, and uh, I went from working about you know anywhere from forty to sixty hours a week to you know, sitting around in my can. So I wrote a book. I wrote a book about my experiences in uh, starting a martial arts school from scratch with uh, no money, no credit, no students, and no connections. And that book was Small Doja Big Profits. Um, After I wrote the book and spent a considerable amount of time writing it and editing it, I realized that nobody in my industry was going to publish it because the book was not mainstream. Um, it was, uh, you know, at the time, as somebody once told me, they told me, your book is very angry <laughs> because I had had a lot of experiences that left me uh, embittered about the martial arts industry and, and kind of the overall integrity of some of the, the sales and marketing right. techniques and so forth that were being taught. But uh, because of that book, I ended up becoming a, uh, you know, somewhat of a, I, I call myself a coach. I hate the word consultant, but I do consulting, small business consulting for martial arts schools and, and uh, teach sales and marketing techniques and, and uh, you consult with uh, school owners on starting uh, successful martial arts schools. Yeah, I, it's kind of like uh, I love how Dan Kennedy talks about you. Know, he's the professor of harsh reality. 
Right. <laughs> Love Dan Kennedy. Uh, and, you know, I've been thinking of names. I don't know. I'm going to be like the professor of, um, of proof and profits, you know, or something like that. But, it, yeah, it's, it's like sometimes you can come across as angry, but it's like, you know, you're right. We are. I mean, because there's so much hype. There's so much BS. You know, like I'm sitting here. I'm pulling up all your different accounts before we got started, you know, and people – um, some would be shocked that you only have a thousand and eighty followers on Twitter, mm-hmm. right? It's like, oh my gosh, you're not, you don't have a million followers on Twitter. Are you really successful? Can you really be a successful business owner, author, consultant, and and dude with money and not be super big on Twitter? You know, it's like, oh, it, it makes me angry. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's funny because, um, well, I, I guess Twitter, Twitter really isn't a social media platform that I that I focus on. But it's interesting because I do get a lot of, I do get a lot of customers through Twitter. Amazingly, even though I don't focus on it, but but um, the, I entered into the martial arts business industry niche. Um, I kind of fell into it backwards because I wrote that manual. I mainly wrote the manual because I was bored and I had a lot of things to say about the industry. And uh, it became kind of an underground sensation. I ended up self-publishing it and selling it. As a matter of fact, um, Dan Kennedy's book, The Ultimate Sales Letter, was the <laughs> guidebook I used for writing my first sales letter to sell that book. And it just kind of took off, you know. And the thing is, is that my my niche is really very small. You know, there are probably at any given time ten to fifteen thousand martial arts studios. Uh, in the United States, and it's growing. It has grown. I, I don't have recent statistics, but it has grown since the advent of the UFC and the popularity of the Ultimate Fighter show and so forth. But but uh, the number of guys and gals out there that run martial arts studios who are actually actively interested in getting martial arts business information is really – you know, pretty small. It's, it's, a, you know, I would say it may be less than 5% of those people that are running martial arts schools because they're mostly interested in, uh, in being craftsmen and, and not businessmen. But what I find interesting is even though, you know, I'm, I'm not a wealthy individual, you know, selling my information products and offering people consulting services to, you know, to small business owners has paid a heck of a lot of my bills for the last 10 years. And that's been through some pretty rough times too. Right. Um, Almost losing a business during the Great Recession, um, having some health issues where I couldn't work. I couldn't work full time. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, a lot of that has to do with um, just being honest and treating people right. I think I've had a lot of repeat customers and a lot of referral business that's helped me over the years uh, grow to, to the point where I am today. Wait a minute. We got to be honest to grow a business? <laughs> yeah. Goodness Wait. gracious. I got to hit delete on this. Yeah, you better back that up. You know, it, it's funny too because I was kind of thinking, you know, I, I'd like to prepare for these uh, for these interviews because, you know, I have a podcast on my own and I interview people all the time. And, and, and typically what I do is, is I'll send people just kind of a list of questions that I'm going to ask them. And, you know, you were like, no, you know, I want to do this conversationally, which I, I appreciate actually. You know, it makes it a lot more natural and real. But I was just kind of thinking about some of the things that, that you know, you know, I would like to talk about our, you know, situations that I was in. And when I was a young man, I was very impressionable. I was looking for business mentors and we had joined a consulting company that was also our martial arts billing company and started going to their seminars and getting their sales training and marketing training. And, uh, my wife and I took their information. We started changing the approach that we had in our business. And these people would tell us to do things, you know, in order to close sales because their whole deal was you get as many people in the front door as possible, close as many sales as quickly as you can, knowing that most of those students won't stick around for more than a couple of months. And then those students are out the back door and you're placing with new students, cashing them out, getting as much money as you can up front, really kind of sleazy. So we didn't do the whole kit and caboodle, but we did start (laughs) using some of their sales techniques, which are not really sales techniques at all. It's just simply lying, being disingenuous, you know, like telling people when they'd come in and they would ask you questions like, well, you know, what's your registration fee for? And then you tell them, well, it's for insurance. You know, it's, it's to cover you for insurance in the martial arts studio, which is an absolute lie. I mean, it only costs you 500 bucks a year to, to get martial arts school liability insurance. Right. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's an, it's an obvious lie or telling people things, you know, like when they, when they would come to you and say, you know, we would like to uh, modify our agreement or modify our membership or get out of our membership or what have you. Well, you know, we don't handle that. The billing company has complete control over that. So you're going to have to deal with the billing company because we can't help you with that. You know, it is really just doing a disservice to your client. And what I didn't realize at the time is, is that uh, I had developed relationships with my clientele based on honesty and integrity. 
And I didn't really understand it because I hadn't, I hadn't really taken any ethics classes at this time in college. Later on, I didn't take those <laughs> ethics classes and, and figured out why things were going sideways for me when I started doing this stuff. But, you know, I was just a young kid who was kind of like, I want to say a street kid, but a kid who had to come up the hard way. You just learned how to hustle. And uh, I had never really done a lot of serious inner reflection on on how my actions and my business impacted my customers and my relationships with them. So when my customers start, you know, kind of, you know, falling by the wayside or they're leaving or they're coming back to me and tell me, you know, I don't really like the way you're running your business. You know, I really had to do some serious reflection. And thankfully, you know, I married a uh, very wise and godly woman who <laughs> basically told me, you know what, it's because you're taking advice from the wrong people. And, uh, you know, I, you know, she told me cause she handled a lot of stuff in the office. She said, I'm just not comfortable with the way that we're dealing with clients now. And I want to go back to the way we did it before. And after some reflection and conversation, I agreed with her. And, uh, you know, of course, as you can imagine, you know, business started picking up again and, and, uh, my referral business picked up and so forth. And, and that was that and we never looked back. So, but then you realize being uh, unethical would help you in law school. So you just threw all that away? Yeah, right. (laughs) Well, actually, to tell you the truth, I dropped out of law school after six weeks because I realized that that, uh, it wasn't for me because I realized that I could not lie for a living. And man, man, that's tough. All right. Any attorneys listen to that? If we know you, like Kevin McGuire, we love you. You're a great attorney. Okay. But everybody There's, else, I, I don't know about. I tell you, I, I say that jokingly because my brother-in-law is uh, is a senior partner in a, in a firm that he founded. And, and uh, he's he's probably one of the most honest guys I know. So he hears me say stuff like this, you know, just kind of gets his goat. But but for the most part, I realized that, you know, there was, <laughs> there was really a lot – uh, to being an attorney that had to do with, you know, maybe representing clients that, uh, that you wouldn't normally associate with and so forth. And I just realized that I wasn't the type of guy that I could do it. I figured, you know, in, in, I maybe not have mentioned this, but my hobby is writing fiction. So I figured if I was going to lie for a living, I'd, I'd do it honestly as a fiction writer. There you go. Uh, so, all right, you, uh, you and your wife go back to being honest. You get the law school bug, you drop out of that and, and you, I mean, did you sell your current business uh, and then have to start from scratch or what happened there? Yeah. What happened was, uh, you know, I was running my business for a couple of years and uh, a few years before I met my wife. Then uh, we got married in 99. So I really, the business kind of took off in 96. We got married in 99. Once my wife came in and started working the business, the business kind of exploded. That was about the same time that we hired the consulting company, started using some of their marketing principles, which are really good. It was really the sales principles that we had issues with. And that did help us grow our school. Then we went back to after about a year of using their sales principles, which you know, we're unprincipled. And um, we went back to doing the things the way that, that I'd always done them, you know, just treating people honestly, treating people the way you want to be treated, you know, using advocacy based selling, being, you know, just being an advocate for the client and making sure that whenever somebody walked in the front door to the studio, that this was absolutely the best place for them to train, that, you know, we were sure that we were going to be able to meet their needs and meet their needs in such a way that they would feel comfortable with it after the sale, that we wouldn't have any dissonance after the sale. You know, where somebody would come back with buyer's remorse and so forth and, and making sure also that we did things to, to ensure that if somebody did come back and there was some dissonance after the sale that we couldn't clear up, that they had every opportunity to, you know, um, get out of their contract and leave. So we started doing things like offering a 30 day, um, you know, unconditional guarantee where anytime within the, the first 30 days of their membership, you know, somebody could cancel and leave, you know, for any reason, whatever reason, it didn't matter. It was unconditional. And we wouldn't ask questions except for just to find out if we did something wrong. So we did that for a few more years and I ended up selling that business in 2003, I believe. And that's when I wrote the book. And then I got in law school in 2004. And uh, like I said, it didn't last there very long. So Interestingly enough, about the time that I decided I was going to go ahead and drop out of law school instead of wasting, uh, you know, two and a half more years of my life, um, a friend approached me and, and uh, wanted to start another business, and that didn't pan out, so I ended up starting another martial arts school. So that was my second martial arts school. And that one, I started right before the bottom fell out of the mortgage industry in the housing industry. And what's interesting is the first school I started, I started in a very uh, affluent or fairly affluent community. It's a bedroom community here in Austin, Texas. And the second school I started was in a community where um, it was kind of a bedroom community for Austin, Texas, but not really for affluent people, really for people that were moving out of the inner city. They were kind of experiencing inner city flight uh, because of, you know, all sorts of different, you know, 
socioeconomic factors that were, you know, happening in Austin at the time. So what I didn't realize was in this little town, even though it was the second fastest, fastest growing town in Texas at the time, that a lot of the homes that were being sold and people moving in, they were, you know, FHA housing and so forth, you know, that, uh, you know, people who had gotten home loans that really weren't qualified for them. So the business grows kind of organically for about a year. And I'm in a very, you know, uh, small kind of potion stamp uh, location. My overhead is really low, which was what I liked. But I decided, you know, you know what, I'm just going to go and grow this school again. I'm just going to grow another large school. So I go and I find another location and I triple my overhead overnight. And within probably a couple of weeks after I signed the lease on that space and was gearing up to do all the extra programs and buying all the extra equipment and vehicles for all the things I wanted to do in that school, after school, martial arts and all kinds of other stuff, uh, that's when the economy started to tank. And it started with the gas crisis where the gas prices you know, kind of went through the roof. And that really impacted my ability to enroll people in those additional programs. And then all of a sudden we started seeing you know, houses uh, foreclosing all in neighborhoods all around the, uh, the location. So what happened was um, I went through about probably a year and a half to two year period in that school where it was just touch and go, where we didn't really know if we were going to be able to pay our bills from month to month. So I had to get very creative in how I went about saving that school. And uh, what was interesting too, is is about the same time that uh, I think everybody in small business was making a transition from traditional print advertising methods, which I'd always relied on. I'd always relied on print advertising and direct mail uh, marketing. And, And people were making the switch over to internet marketing. And because of the fact that I had had to market my martial arts business manual myself online, it was really the only way I could sell it. Um, I had picked up a lot of internet marketing skills, copywriting skills, and so forth. So my budget was so tight that I just couldn't afford to advertise in the paper anymore. I mean, I couldn't even run small ads in the paper. I was actually, I actually owed the newspaper money. So I decided, you know what, if I'm going to make this thing go, the only thing I really can do is market it online. So I started applying everything I learned in internet marketing to marketing my small local business. And amazingly, (laughs) and surprisingly to me now, but uh, to my amazement, my school started to grow. And uh, grew very quickly, uh, simply from, you know, using just old school online direct marketing methods, uh, you know, writing long form sales letters that were written specifically to each audience that I was trying to reach, whether it be moms that wanted to enroll their kids in martial arts to increase their confidence and help them get better grades and so forth, or or whether it was the same moms or, or young women who wanted to lose weight, get into a fitness kickboxing program or my fitness boot camp program, which I also started as another income stream or what have you. And then building email lists and continuing to market to those email lists on a regular basis and, and uh, kind of get those people that fell through the cracks on the front end of our sales process and, and try to get them in, you know, after the fact, maybe if they didn't come in initially for some reason or what have you, you know, kind of entice them through special offers and so forth that we would send out in our email sales letters. Right. And it, it just worked really well. Um, that that little business that I had, you know, we went from, gosh, struggling with about 40 or 50 students up to about 120 students before um, I sold it about five years later. Wow. So, yeah, which, is, which is not a large school, I will say. That's not really a large school in the martial arts world. But because of the approach that I take, I keep my overhead low. So I, you know, my business model is, is I don't really need to have a whole lot of students to make, uh, you know, to make a decent living. So. Yeah, and it's all about how much you keep, right? Exactly, yeah. That's what I try to teach my clients. So let me get this straight because you were, you were talking about being offline and online. So are you saying – because you got started in the Dan Kennedy world of, of direct mail, right, physical uh, letters, right, newsletters or, or, or yeah. ads. Yeah, mostly postcards is what I would rely on to sell, you know, to get people in. And it, the thing is in the martial arts industry, you know, when you're running a martial arts school, you know, here's basically how it works. You know, you have to get – what I teach my clients is they need to get about 30 to 40 solid leads, which are people that are interested in taking martial arts, so roughly one and a half leads a day uh, in order to keep their hopper full. And then out of those leads that they get, they need to enroll about half of those, maybe a third to half, depending on how good they are at sales, um, in order to keep their school growing. And uh, this is a, a school that's based on the, the business principles I teach, you know, low overhead, you know, a small school, not having a, you know, a, a big footprint, you know, not having a, a location that's somewhere in a high foot traffic area where you're just paying for the location or what have you. Um, and 
so, you know, what you're constantly doing is, you know, you're going to have an attrition rate in a martial arts studio of anywhere from 3 to 5%. Um, below 3% is really, really, really good. Industry-wide, I'd say most martial arts schools are probably losing about 5% of their students a month. And, you know, it's what I call insensible attrition. It just happens no matter what you do. You're going to lose at least 3% of your students every month because, you know, people have babies, their jobs change, they move, you know, they get married, what have you. Life just gets busy. So you're constantly on this kind of treadmill replacing those people that are leaving. And because it's the type of business that's that's based off of a membership or, a, you know, if you will, a subscription type business, you know, you're trying to keep those people around for the long haul too. You're trying to increase your retention. But if you don't keep that hopper full, you know, and you don't continually get a, a new influx of students, you know, 24-7, 365, if you're not working on that, your school is going to slowly die. So, you know, our sales process really was, you know, just do whatever we could to get people in the front door. I think Dan Kennedy quotes a guy that was either a chiropractor or a dentist in one of his books that said, you know, I don't know of one way to get 100 new clients, but I know 100 ways to get one. So right. I use them all. And that's kind of what we do. Right. And uh, I think a lot of small businesses do that. And then <laughs> once we get them in the door, you know, once we get somebody in the door and we get them to sample our product or our service, then we know we can probably sell them. Right. So between my wife and I, we got to the point to where once we got people in the door, we were closing ninety percent. Wow. Yeah, which is, you know, simply because I knew my audience. You know, I knew it was you know moms either looking to get their kids in, in a program to help them you know raise better children, happier children, or you know moms that wanted to come in to get in shape. You know, that was really the market that I went for. And, you know, I didn't really focus on anything else. I just made the, you know, my entire business, you know, child-friendly, mom-friendly. And I think that's what sold people on it. Right. You know, everybody talks about getting in shape. I mean, look, round is a shape. Round so is a shape. <laughs> I am in shape, you know. And, you know, uh, everybody wants flat abs. I have a flat back, right? So what's – I get points for that, right? <laughs> yeah. I think so. You just got right. to walk down the beach backwards. That's there, all. There you, that reminds me of a joke, but I'll have to tell you that one <laughs> offline. Uh, yeah, <laughs> little kids may be listening to this one. Um, so it sounds like, though, the, the principles you teach uh, and recommend, I mean, I, I followed a lot of them. You know, I, I kept my overhead low. I've only had an office for one year out of 15 years of working from home and nine years of doing my own thing. Uh, and... You know, keeping th- keeping the costs low are also what helped me survive as well. You know, the downturn and, mm-hmm. and everything else. But I mean, would would you did you learn from other industries, or did, was this just uh, you know skin in your knee and, and, and trial and error? Then you then you realize, oh wow, this this does apply to everything else. You know, mm-hmm. how can people shorten their own learning curve um, to grow their own business? I learned from being poor. That's, that's what I learned from. I mean, <laughs> you know, everybody always has, you know, everybody always has their own hard luck story, you know, but I mean, really, honestly, I'm one of the few people that I know that actually grew up in America knowing what it was like to, to be hungry all the time, mm-hmm. you know, not knowing where our meals were going to come from the next, from day to day. Um, you know, I can remember, you know, weeks in the summertime when school wasn't in session because I love school being in session because I got free school meals and I can remember, you know, eating mustard sandwiches and raw potatoes for like a week or stealing, you know, vegetables out of the neighbor's garden. You know, that's just how we survived. Mm -hmm. So I grew up being very resourceful and, you know, I failed three times in starting a martial arts school. I had three failures behind me before I had my first successful business. And for a lot of people, that's not a lot of failures, I know, but, you know, there was a lot of time and effort invested in that. It was a couple of years of my life. So when it finally came time to start that school, I had no choice but to start it lean and to bootstrap it. So... You know, I, I realized, you know, I'm never going to get a bank to loan me any money. I don't have any contacts. I don't have any rich uncles that are going to loan me any money. So I need to finance this thing myself. I didn't even know what bootstrapping was at the time. I just knew that's what I had to do. Now, there was a you know, very kind gentleman named Jim Mather. He was, uh, he's a very high-ranking black belt in California. He's since retired. But he used to run a company called International Martial Arts Management Systems. And he wrote a book. It was one of the first martial arts business manuals I read. It was a very good book. I don't even know if it's available anymore. But uh, I'd recommend it highly to anybody out there that, uh, that can find a copy of it. Because, you know, really what he taught was is he taught that kind of system of bootstrapping. You know, you go, you start a part-time program, you build up your clientele, and then, uh, you know, out of that clientele, you set aside money, reinvest money in your business, blah, blah, blah. And then once you start a school, you know, really you try to keep your overhead as low as possible, you know. And that's, that's really what he taught. And because he was, you know, the first person that I came in contact with in the martial arts industry where I found that his 
actions matched his words. And he was, you know, absolutely a man of integrity. I just listened to everything that he taught, everything that he taught me. I just soaked up like a sponge. And that's what really helped me kind of develop, you know, that kind of mindset and that, uh, you know, that framework, if you will, for, for running a lean business and, and starting a lean business and, you know, uh, bootstrapping my little martial arts studio. And what's funny was I, I did it and I didn't realize how good of a thing I had because there was one point in my business where I, I, I got the big school bug, as they say, and I wanted to, you know, triple my square footage and do all this other, all these other things. And I kind of got saved from that by somebody who was, who was uh, not a very, um, uh, honest person. It was a local, um, landlord that had run into some space and, and basically promised to get us in there in two months and eight months later, we still weren't in. And he had, you know, 20 some thousand dollars of my money. We never did get into that space because he, he could never build a space and satisfy the local uh, building code inspectors uh, to allow us to have a COA, you know, a certificate of, uh, or uh, a certificate of occupancy, I should say, right. uh, to get in the business, uh, get in the, the location. So I never did get to expand the way I wanted to. And uh, it caused us a lot of problems. We ended up having to sue the guy and so forth. But what that experience actually taught me was is it gave me some time to reflect and look at some of my other friends who were actually expanding schools, getting larger, uh, you know, uh, lease space and you know, stuff like that. And look at all the heartaches and headaches that they had going through that. And that kind of uh, made me realize that, you know, having the biggest school and being able to, to, uh, you know, to boast all your friends when you go to martial arts seminars and so forth, you know, that I have a 10,000 square foot stool school and 800 students is just really not where it's at. And it wasn't where it was at for me. Right. And I would say the Lord works in mysterious ways. He answers every prayer. Sometimes it's just a no. (laughs) It was was a big no. It was a big 18 month long, lose all my hair. No. Oh my gosh. That's, that's what it was. But you know what? It was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had because, you know, it, it, I, I learned a lot of lessons, you know, from that. Number one, I learned that, you know, when you're a righteous person and when you're in the right, you know, not to give in to somebody else who is trying to take advantage of you, who is, uh, who is a person that lacks morals, who is an immoral person, you know, that eventually that, uh, you know, that, that the, the Lord's going to fight your case. And that's what happened. And the second thing that I learned was, is that, uh, you know, I, my wife was just fantastic. You know, I, I, I learned that, uh, you know, I'd married the right person because, you know, she was there with me, you know, side by side through the whole thing. And it was just as hard on her as it was on me, but boy, she, you know, she really helped me out through that process. So didn't this real estate guy know that, you know, 17 ways to kill him with your thumb? Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny at the time is I was kind of known for being the children's martial arts instructor. I don't really think people took my martial arts skills seriously at the time. So, you know, I, I don't think that was a, I don't think that was a, a you know, a, a concern for him. Well, Although, you got to make an example of one, you know? Yeah. Well, I do remember, um, we ended up settling out of court. Actually, we didn't go to court. We ended up settling in actually in mediation. And, uh, I'm not supposed to talk about the specifics of the case because of the settlement, but I do remember sitting across the, uh, the table from him and, and, uh, staring him down and making him sweat bullets. So <laughs> that was kind of fun. Well, it's because you had a samurai sword on and you know, the headband, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I probably had a crazy look in my, at the time I was, I was, I was, ready to be done with the guy but uh yeah when you yeah. rip your t-shirt in half and you know well, you yeah, know i get nervous too yeah to get hulk <laughs> out on him you know oh my gosh yeah I, I made my attorney laugh a couple of times too at some of the things i said to the guy i can't remember what i said but i know it, it was it was pure intimidation and it worked out in our favor yeah so, i heard i heard you had to pay like 10 grand in, in law books because you ripped them all in half during the yeah, negotiation right, right? Yeah, okay <laughs> yeah, that's not me that was that was some other that was steven seagal you know he's above the law <laughs> So uh, we, we just got a phone, but it was a small one, but still it was a phone book. And uh, I don't know why we still get those, but now I know why we got them. Cause my 18 year old son, and we just dropped off at college. It's like two weeks ago. He, he, he put a crease in the thing somehow and he ripped it in half. And I was like, so yeah. that's how they do it. He started laughing. The thing kids can find on YouTube. Um, you just got to put a little crease in it. And he sure enough ripped it in. Half. <laughs> yeah. I, have, I have a friend, Mike Gillette, who's a martial artist. He's an ex SWAT commander and, and whatnot. And he's a professional strong man. And, uh, he does all that crazy stuff. He's not a big guy either. I mean, he's muscular, he's well muscled, but he's, he's not a big guy. And I mean, he rips, he rips telephone books and half like the big telephone books wraps, you know, two steel bars around his arm and like breaks chains and does all this crazy stuff. It's just, <laughs> it's just unreal. It's amazing what this guy can do, you know? That's and, so uh, funny. 
Yeah, well, he does that stuff, and I just look at it, and I'm like, wow, you're mental, but that's really cool. Uh, yeah, it's like that skill and a dollar fifty will get you a cup of coffee at McDonald's. Well, you know, the, the wonderful thing about Mike is is that he started doing it to help youth, and yeah. he, go, he goes out and he does shows and, and uh, speaks to youth, and he does a lot of good things with it. So good Christian guy. You know, I have the most respect for him. That's cool. So, so what happened there? So you, you sold that business. I mean, but you're back, right? I mean, do you still run a martial arts studio, or are you just coaching uh, and training other owners? Well, you know, I uh, I teach part time now. After I sold the second martial arts studio that that weathered the storm of the Great Recession, uh, I took a couple of years off and uh, did consulting and did some other things. And then I got the bug again, and I wanted to try something different. So uh, what we were doing, myself and my business partner at the time, we were certifying people in in two different programs that we had. One of them was a self-defense curriculum, and the other one was a fitness boot camp curriculum. And I started sharing that fitness boot camp curriculum because during the recession, it was one of the uh, additional programs that I added to my business that helped save my business. Um, I added probably $4,000 to my bottom line just by teaching fitness boot camps three days a week in that oh, wow. martial arts studio. And that was back when, you know, nobody had fitness boot camps, you know, it was a new thing and I could charge, you know, the, you know, what it was worth. You can't do it now because everybody and their brothers at the YMCA charging 40 bucks a month. But at the time it was a good business model. So we were certifying people and traveling and doing seminars and so forth. And I wanted to have a, a place that I could use as a lab to kind of experiment with all these different things we were doing. So I started a, my smallest martial arts school yet. It was a thousand square feet. I set it up to where I would only have to work in there ten hours a week, and I was pulling, you know, not a lot of money, maybe like two, three grand a month in profit out of it. Just you know, in there ten hours a week part time, and then doing all the other stuff I was doing, and ran that one for a couple of years. And then one of my employees, uh, you know, I, I knew that he wanted to start his own thing, so I just uh, kind of let him take it over and sold it to him for for a song. And since that time, I've just been doing uh, just been doing consulting work and writing. Gotcha. I thought you were like a, maybe a, a professional Facebook uh, commentator. Yeah, you would think so, wouldn't you? <laughs> you know, if uh, if I got paid for all the time I spent arguing with illogical people on Facebook, you know, it, yeah. It, 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 oh, it's... I know. I've I've started just putting things on my own blog, and I tell oh. people just this morning a buddy of mine's like, oh, I don't know about this one. I said, leave a comment on my blog, and we'll engage. I, I'm just not going to do it. I, I, I'll use yeah. Facebook and social media to. Um, get traffic, right, and, and get mm-hmm. eyeballs. But, yeah, I, I want to have the discussion on my own page with my own traffic because, uh, you know, good old Mark Zuckerberg, he, he, he's making enough money. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, that's actually not a bad idea. Um, I have a blog out there that uh, that I need to do something with. I, most of my stuff, you know, most of my, my online presence is in the martial arts industry. I just have a few sites and, and other niches. I have a site for my for my pen name, my fiction pen name, and some other stuff. But, uh, right. but yeah, that's really not a bad idea. Oh, yeah. Drive them back to your own, man. Got to gotta have your own home on the web, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, in, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been through this, but if, if you've ever been the type of person that had like, you know, 300 domain names with GoDaddy.com and, yep. you know, you've got way too many, way too many websites. I've been paring, paring down, paring back on that, you know? Oh, uh, well, I, and I do, and I am, right? I, I'm taking, cause for a while I was thinking, you know, I need separate URLs for my books and different programs and, mm-hmm. and more and more. I mean, I'm keeping those URLs, but just redirecting them. And just building them out, you know, as a subdomain or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a landing page just off of the saleswhisper.com because just just updating, patching a WordPress site, you know, one or two page site that you have just to sell a program. I mean, even that can be burdensome. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're right. So but I like having a lot of domain names because it's, it's easy, right? Yeah, I can redirect. Uh, but you know, with a simple URL, it's memorable. But, yeah, maintaining all that, what a pain. It is, you know, and, and what's interesting is that, uh, you know, what I found is I, I really thought when I started getting into writing, I always wanted to be an author, you know, I was a voracious reader as a kid and finally just got tired of picking up books on Amazon, uh, you know, after my wife got me a Kindle and, uh, you know, going, gosh, I could write something better than this. And finally, my, my wife just kept telling me, you know, well, why don't you? So I did and, uh, you know, wrote a couple of fiction novels. But what was interesting is that I thought I would just write the book. You know, it's kind of like you build it and they'll come. I should have known better. And uh, it's it's all about marketing no matter what you get into and especially being an author, an independent author. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's just it's just all about marketing and having an online presence. If you, I mean, honestly, too, if you want to get a, a publication deal, you know, I mean, you're not going to get a publication contract with a major publisher unless you have an online platform and a huge right. following. So. Yep. I mean, that, that's it. It's, you know, what, 
How big is your list? How much money can you make us? If you can make us a lot of money, then we'll let you pay us to print your book. <laughs> yeah, which begs the question, if you had, if you have that huge following and you can sell books on your own, why do you need the publication contract the, or the publishing contract in the first place? But Exactly. Uh, well, Mike, thanks for coming on the show. Where should we send people that want to connect with you? Uh, you know, martialartsbusinessdaily.com is uh, – that's kind of home base for me as far as my, uh, my presence in the, uh, in the martial arts business industry online. Right. And uh, if anybody wants to check out my fiction work, you know, if you like uh, zombie novels and you like reading pulp, if you were, if you ever a fan of a fan of uh, pulp novels growing up, you know, like your, uh, you know, uh, Doc Savage and stuff like that, uh, you can check me out at mdmassey m a s s e y dot com and and check out my books there. I'd be happy to uh, to uh, you know have you check out my stuff. Oh, so you changed the name up a little bit, huh? Yeah, I had to because I didn't want to confuse people. I have so many books in the martial arts niche on on Amazon, and I just didn't want to confuse my readers. So, right, gotcha. Well, so for this episode, though, it'll be the salesforce dot com slash Mike dash Massey M A S S I E. Uh, but all the my notes from this, and I'll be linking to your various books uh, and your mdmassey.com. So head on over there uh, for all of the the notes and the reviews and the links. Uh, well, Mike from Austin, man, I, I will be out there soon. I may be out uh, as early as uh, October. My mom still lives out in Bastrop, so uh, I will let you know, and we'll go knock one back. Sounds good, man. I'll take you for some good barbecue while you're down here. All right. Hey, you know, I'm easy, man, but I do love me some um, some Rudy's Barbecue. Uh, Rudy's, but yeah, I've yeah. got to take it. I'll have to take you to some of my uh, favorite joints. All right. Well, I mean, there's a salt lick, and you know, I like I like a little Chewy's. Uh, I like their uh, quesadilla. You got to or the uh, the the chili uh, cheese dip. Oh my gosh. Mm, yeah, Kirby Lane's the place to go for that. But all right, all right, and, and a Shiner Bock. As long as I got Shiner Bock, it's all good. <laughs> okay, man. Well, I'll take care of you when you come down. <laughs> all right, Mike. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh huh. Thanks. Some good stuff right there, isn't it? How many times have you thought you were crazy? How many times have your friends told you you were crazy? Uh, mainly because you did not want to be part of the crowd. You wanted to buck the trends. You wanted to zig when everyone else was zagging. Uh, but that's what great entrepreneurs do. They see the opportunity and they seize it. They take massive action. You know, they buy when there's blood in the streets. Right? That means you're going you know, counter-cultural. You're going against what everyone else is doing, and that's really the only way to make money. Uh, certainly, it's the, the fastest, easiest, but albeit the, the scariest way. Um, you know, in this interview, uh, Mike talked about he read a lot of Dan Kennedy, and honestly, Dan Kennedy is a big part uh, of my success as well. Uh, so I mentioned at the top of the podcast, the beginning, that – I'd have another URL for you, so please check out uh, what is on my bookshelf as well and has been for years, uh, and it's an offering from Dan Kennedy. If you visit thesalespodcast.com forward slash magnetic, that will take you to a special page where you can check out the Magnetic Marketing Program. And I guarantee you, if you buy it, if you read it, if you test it and implement uh, the recommendations and the advice in there, your business will grow as well. If you are a business owner, your number one job is to market your business. If you're a salesperson, your number one job is to prospect. But marketing is a big part of prospecting. It certainly can be, even if you're an employee. It's all about how you market yourself, how you stand out from the competition. And little hinges can swing big doors. So little things you make changes you make to your business card, changes you make to your PowerPoint slides for your presentations, changes in the way that you approach people at a trade show, at a conference. All of those really are part of marketing. They're part of prospecting. They go hand in hand. So avail yourself of tools like this. It's exactly what I did when I was an employee, which is why I'm no longer an employee. So again, check out the salespodcast.com forward slash magnetic. And let me know what kind of success you have. And as always, remember to sell different. <laughs>